When putting together these zombies retrospectives, it's hard to distill a map's essence using an exact formula as each map that we look into is more than just a piece of content that we play every now and then. Each map actually reflects quite a bit back at us, reminding fans of what was going on in our lives and in the community at that point in time. And when talking about Voyage of Despair, well, things just get complicated. Let me explain. Over the years, the developers at Treyarch had been handling with almost near perfection the delicate balance of evolving the zombies mode inside of the Black Ops series. The goal being to to somehow keep each game feeling familiar enough to the previous one, but to also move the needle forward so that there was a feeling of progression occurring simultaneously, then somehow finally merging all of the concepts in such a way that allows the mode to age alongside the community for years to come. It sounds almost impossible, but somehow Treyarch has done this over and over again with only a few slip-ups along the way. However, with Black Ops 4, Treyarch decided to shift the needle heavily, creating a rift of distrust that still hasn't quite been healed to this day. <laughs> leave something for BO4. Like, it needs something. Let <laughs> Fuck oh my <laughs> the Chaos storyline was thrust upon us, and at the tip of this new narrative spear, we had Voyage of Despair alongside Nine, which will be discussed in the next video. And while this new world looked magnificent and over the top, fans couldn't help but notice the limelight beaming brightly atop this new content made it feel like Ether was being traded in for a younger, hotter model. When combined with the sorry state of Black Ops 4 at launch, it's clear why most people were put off from Voyage of Despair and the Chaos storyline as a whole, as it quite frankly felt unfair fair. But as much as the past can guide our perspective, it's important to understand what Voyage of Despair is now that time has passed. Who was this map and storyline for? Was a Titanic Zombies map a good idea? Did this map age alongside the player base for the better? Well, fortunately, this iceberg goes down a lot deeper than it appears, so let's grab our life jackets and make our way to the poop deck. This is Voyage of Despair. Before examining Voyage in greater detail, I think it's first important to understand what exactly the Chaos Story is, why it was created, and the perspective of the developers at the time. Because honestly, all of Treyarch's logic is completely sound here, but in order to grasp the why, we have to go back, and I mean way back. When Call of Duty Zombies was first born inside of Nocturne and Toten, nobody knew what the hell was going on, especially the developers. Treyarch was constantly flying by the seam of their pants trying to satiate the popularity of what became this overnight night sensation. And over time, the devs would just start to add new things here and there, building upon what was based off of their own intuition and community feedback. In Shinonuma, we hid the, the secret radio message, basically just to see how long it would take for somebody to find it. Suddenly, and there are all these theories and websites popping up, and there are all these things where we're like, oh, whoa, what do we do? Like, <laughs> I guess we're going to have to actually, you know, rein this in and do something with it. Someone had written a post that said, guys, I was playing, and there's a zombie that when he swipes you, I think he says something, you know, he, he comes up to you and he goes, Sam! <laughs> so that's why in, in Doris when we wrote the um, Samantha and Dr. Maxis, that's why the little girl's name was Samantha. Was now, because the developers wrote the story as they went, it was only natural for it to become a wild and tangled mess of contradictions and confusing events that never really clicked if you sat and thought deeply about it. And once you understand this fact, it really makes sense why the multiverse was created inside of Black Ops 3 Zombies, as it was the best narrative tactic to reel the story into various pockets that were somewhat self-contained, yet somewhat connected. And don't get me wrong, I think this is what gives the Ether story its charm. It's unabashedly impressive perfect, and that's why myself and many other fans love it so damn much. But when ending on such a high note with Black Ops 3 and Zombies Chronicles, it's all but certain that fans will have sky-high expectations that need managing. So when Black Ops 4 teased and marketed to tie a bow on this amazing 10-year journey, the community was a bit confused when this happened. Black Ops 4 marks the beginning of a brand new storyline, separate and distinct from the Ether story, a new world with new characters and new enemies. Now, I don't want to sell the BO4 reveal event short because it was fucking hype, especially when we realized how much content was arriving on launch day. But it was still very odd that this new story was being introduced when the momentum for Ether was at full speed. However, even though it could be considered odd, it still made complete sense that this new story would be introduced as it would need to replace the old one. And unlike the foundation of zombies in World at War, the chaos story could be told in a genuine narrative fashion and could be created with the 
intention of telling a tale rather than throwing random things at the wall to see what sticks. Why is now a good time to, to start a new chapter in zombies? First one being that the ether story we've been telling for the last 10 years. So that is incredibly complicated, incredibly involved, and actually our fan base love that about it. But there's a part of our community who've come in a little bit later on. It's almost unfair to them to be able to kind of jump into that 10 year story and kind of find their footings. We felt that now was a perfect time to start a new story. As we were making the 10 year story, we'd have ideas that we'd like, oh, we, we could put that in, but it felt like we were jamming it in. But uh -huh. I was like, okay, now is a good time. We've got all these great ideas here. Let's start afresh. And that means we can also not only kind of cater to our 10 year fan base, but also a new fan base that's starting as well. I think we can all empathize with what Jason mentioned in that clip, even if in the back of our brains there was a nagging voice wishing that the entire focus of the game was just on Ether. Because up to this point, the limelight really had shifted away from Ether entirely. The marketing being released was all chaos, from music videos to the ultimate edition of the game to a brand new comic book series, it really felt unbalanced. But the community was relying so heavily on Treyarch's reputation that we trusted that they knew what they were doing. And most importantly, we trusted that they wouldn't let us down. On the 12th of October in 2018, Black Ops 4 was finally available to the public and the community began digging into the largest content offering in Zombies history. Within the Blood of the Dead retrospective, we discussed the BO4 reveal event and the launch of the game in a little more detail, but there are a couple of things I want to touch on here. The first one being how the community was split amongst four maps. There is a common idea that the launch of this many maps was divisive, causing a fracture in our attention when hunting for Easter eggs and hurt the longevity of the game. And I think there is evidence to that argument. However, I think there is a better way to frame it, and that would be to state that it split our attention within the two stories. Because rather than digging into original Ether content and speculating what Primus and Ultimus's next moves were, our imagination was split into two worlds that severely halted momentum of both stories rather than building excitement around one single narrative. And it is tough as a gaming developer to build and maintain momentum around an event, especially one that's heavily community-based. And when you're doing so, not only is it important that the content offering itself is strong, but that it's also very stable. And just like with Blood of the Dead, Voyage was suffering a similar fate. I got you, Peter. Okay, next one's Mercury. Oh, no. you're not kidding me. Oh. Chat, I just thought that oh, portal was- Oh, no. My I knew God. it, I knew it's a Kraken. It's a Kraken. No. Oh, great. I don't know how many times I can do this if we're not even gonna make it anywhere close to the boss. And it crashed. Where's the controller? Old trusty. The lead up to BO4 Zombies release was solely based on faith and expectations alone, which taught the community an important lesson when the rug was pulled from underneath them. Too much had changed at too rapid of a pace. A new story, new perk system, four maps, new specialist system, crazy easter eggs, we were completely overwhelmed. And since our wings of momentum had been clipped due to the poor stability and splitting of attention, the community began accepting some hard truths as we realized that the Ether story was likely going to be getting mistreated as chaos was taking trade. Arc's top priority. There was certainly a lot of doom and gloom when talking about what should have happened with Black Ops 4 during its initial release window, and it's really perplexing as to why the developers' plans were structured in the order that they were. We talk about that a little bit more in depth in the first half of the series, going through all of the Ether maps individually. Link below the like button. But I want to be clear here. Black Ops 4 Zombies is up there in my top three favorite zombies modes, and I love Chaos dearly, but it doesn't stop me from accepting that the ball was completely dropped when it came to how the new content was introduced to fans. So what does that mean for Voyage as a whole? How does it stand out amongst the entirety of the rest of the maps at launch, and even just as a Zombies map in general? Well, like I mentioned in the intro segment, it's complicated. On one hand, Voyage has a really strong main quest and boss fight, but suffers when it comes to general gameplay, map layout, and just general mindless zombies killing. On the other hand, Voyage offers a very strong and compelling narrative, but so do all the Zombies maps in Black Ops 4, so that doesn't really do much to set it apart either. That being said, one one major positive aspect of the narrative design which the Chaos Story allowed for was an ambitious atmosphere and art direction. And even though maps like Blood of the Dead and Classified were both visual feasts for the eyes, Voyage of Despair showed the beginning of an artistic vision we'd never seen before in Zombies. Over the years, Treyarch has truly mastered the ability to identify a seemingly innocuous location and convert it into a Zombies experience. And when strictly looking at the Chaos Story from the lens of creative world building, it was perfect in every 
sense of the word. Mixing mythology, science, history, and the occult really allowed for anything to take place. There is now no location that you are restricted to simply because of the infrastructure the Chaos Story set foundationally. The way we're dealing with history, the way we're dealing with mythology, means that the door's wide open for wherever we need to go, whatever we want to do. As, uh, as, as creative individuals, that's the most exciting thing. You know, we, and we did that with, with, uh, with the ether story. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main difference here with the chaos story is that the way that it's initiated in the world and the way it also cleans itself up means that our understanding of history is preserved. And when you think about it, the Titanic is quite a weird setting for a round-based map, which we will talk about why from a gameplay point of view later in the video. But atmospherically, Voyage is presented with such a deep sense of isolation and, well, despair. Spawning into the map has the player overlooking the ship from the top of the forecastle while the Titanic is crashing into the side of an iceberg. The player wanders down the stairs, slowly getting their bearings while zombies start climbing onto the ship. After getting through the first round, that sense of emptiness creeps back up again while staring out into the empty ocean lit up only by a full moon. I can't even imagine what the experience must have been like for the actual survivors and victims of this tragedy. Absolutely terrifying. Each one of the playable areas from the dining hall to the engine room is brimming with over the top character. And the detail doesn't stop there. The perk statues and the totems in your hand are absolutely beautiful, which is some of the best artwork that Treyarch has done to date. The elixirs, the wall weapons, the doors, sentinel artifacts, Everything on this ship is taken to the max, bringing one of the most detailed environments we had ever seen in a zombies map to date. The developers even went as far as placing the final meals that people were eating in the dining area, and the clocks throughout the ship have the time that the ship actually sank in real life. Treyarch truly went above and beyond bringing this map to life by using top-of-the-line artistry and environmental storytelling to sell this new level of immersion in our new zombies universe. But you can't only have a beautiful atmosphere, you actually have to have a a great story and narrative to hold it all together, and Jason Blundell and Craig Houston made sure that they did just that by setting up a very in-depth jumping off point for our new crew. Scarlet Rhodes, Stanton Shaw, Diego Nicali, and Bruno De La Croix are the four playable characters and their mission is to find adventurer and billionaire Alistair Rhodes who is also Scarlet's father. Alistair had been seeking the truth about an ominous cult called the Order who were attempting to use a sentinel artifact in a substance called Prima Materia in order to rapidly evolve humanity to its next phase of existence, and Alistair Rhodes felt like it was his duty to find and stop them from succeeding, but he eventually runs into trouble and needs help from only those he can fully trust. Now you see, Alistair is the glue that holds this entire story together. Without him and his extravagant pursuits, none of these characters would get together to go on the epic adventure that is Black Ops 4 Zombies. But how did all of this come to be? Why did Alistair's daughter and three seemingly random men come together to help him, and how how did Alistair get into trouble in the first place? Well, initially, Alistair sought out Bruno in Morocco in 1910, where he recruited him to steal a precious artifact that the Order wanted, an artifact that we know now as the Scepter of Ra. As a result of the heist, Bruno was badly shot, eventually bled out and died, but Alistair utilized the Scepter of Ra's powerful ability to revive him, which left Bruno forever indebted to Alistair as well. Months later, chemist Stanton Shaw was in Cambodia, where Alistair tracked him down to ask for his help help alongside this journey. While they were having a discussion, German soldiers arrested Shaw, and Alistair bartered with them, stating that he would trade the soldiers the greatest weapon the world has ever seen for Shaw's release. They then traveled to a temple in Angkor Wat to retrieve the weapon, where it was revealed that there actually was no weapon in the traditional sense, only a small jar of Prima Materia, which transformed the soldiers into zombies. This is important because Shaw was also aware of the stories regarding Prima Materia, but it was always assumed to be of myth and legend. And once Shaw saw the primeval substance in front of his eyes, he knew that Alistair was on to something big. About a year later, Alistair's butler Godfrey made travel arrangements for Alistair to meet up with Diego Nicali in Juarez City, Mexico. Alistair was seeking a particular medallion that would help him unravel these great mysteries. This medallion belonged to Diego. The only problem was that the medallion was a family heirloom that Diego's mother entrusted him with 
and he wasn't willing to give it up that easily. Now, during Alistair's travels in Cambodia with Shaw, the high priest of the ancient order he was investigating had actually been following him and tracked Alistair down to the Juarez City Saloon. A fight breaks out between Alistair, Diego, and the order, and after all the commotion dies down, Diego hands over the medallion to Alistair with the promise that he will one day return it back to him. Now that Alistair was aware that the order was after him and his life was in danger, he writes a letter to his daughter Scarlet explaining the order's plans and how she needs to find Bruno, Diego, and Shaw so that they can come to his rescue if things were to turn out badly. And unfortunately, on March 20th, 1912, that's exactly what happened, as Alistair was taken by the order as seen in another chaos map down the line, which is the best chaos map, by the way, and I won't hear another word about it. And just like the letter asks, Scarlet rounds everyone up to help her father, making their first stop in their pursuit at the RMS Titanic, as the intel suggests it's harboring the Sentinel artifact. Woo! That is a lot. But don't worry, we only have a little bit more to go before we can start breaking down the map itself. So into the intro cutscene. It shows that our four characters are on the ship, pulling off a heist in order to secure that artifact that Alistair had been after. While this is occurring, the Order anticipates our heroes being on the ship, and one of their members ends up intercepting them during said heist. After he steals back the artifact from Scarlet, the remaining members of the Chaos crew surround him, and once he finally realizes he has nowhere to go, he activates the Sentinel artifact, which causes a violent transformation of everyone on the ship by turning them into zombies. This activation also initiates our main quest, which in this storyline is called a trial, and the only way to restore things back to the way they were prior to the artifact's activation is to resolve the steps of the trial. Now, a quick side note, every Sentinel artifact in each map of the Chaos story represents a particular type of god and mythology, and here in Voyage, we are focusing on Norse mythology and the god Odin. Now, the player needs to make their way to the back of the ship and interact with the Sentinel artifact in order for the trial to officially begin. And once we do this, the ship begins to buckle under the weight of Prima Materia, cracking and creaking while slowly sinking into the depths of the North Atlantic Ocean. From there, we can begin unlocking or activating the Pack-a-Punch machine, which is most similar to something like Derizendrak, where the player needs to find the main locations for each machine and activate it by simply interacting with said location. And this is where we can get a great look at the brand new iteration of the machine for the first time. Throughout the Ether storyline, we were so used to that classic Pack-a-Punch machine with its iconic Americana aesthetic, but now we had something completely different. A window into some other area, into another dimension, where statues were standing outside of a staircase leading to an archway beaming with light. And this is just one of many of the small context clues that Treyarch leaves with this story because it's so packed with detail. Now that the pap is open, the player can actually begin the step for the Easter egg, which starts with what the community colloquially calls the clock step. This requires us to locate four different clocks around the ship that can be identified with four different symbols near them. After the clocks have been identified, we need to remember the hour number, the minute number, and the symbol correlated with each particular clock. After that, the player needs to make their way to the poop deck in the engine room where they enter the hour numbers onto each engine order telegraphs, aka Chadburns. While this part of the step can seem daunting, it's really not that difficult. Now, the symbols we have to remember are essentially two sets of triangles. A standard triangle set where one will be facing upward and then another will be upside down, and then the other set of triangles will just be the same exact set, but with a horizontal line inside of it. And a simple way to complete this step is to remember that the left Chadburns are always going to intake the upward pointing triangle, and then the poop deck Chadburns are going to be both of the triangles with lines, while the engine room Chadburns are both of the plane triangles. So it's actually pretty simple. Once the hour hands are completed, the player can make their way to the ship's bridge and do a similar process for the minute hands, but the symbols are written down for you on the Chadburns themselves, so it makes things a lot easier to match correctly. Now it's time to find four electrical outlets around the ship that are spurting out elemental energy which correlate to the elemental zombies. This means that the player has to kill the correct zombie next to the corresponding outlet. I can't even imagine how annoying it must have been for the easter egg hunters to find all of these locations. It's on a similar playing field as the rock step for revelations but a recreation for BO4. It's not nearly as big of a deal replaying these steps knowing all the tricks to get things done but back then I am sure it was tedious. During each of the killings of the elemental zombies, their souls will leave their body and a ritual symbol will be left on the ground. And after all four outlets have been satiated, we can complete a series of rituals where at the end we can pick up the real sentinel artifact. But to do this, we need to complete each ritual in a certain 
order, and that order is poison, water, electric, and then fire. And this is one of the better parts of the main quest, as it's somewhat challenging and puts the player in a variety of different circumstances. And while the encounter is happening, there will be an onslaught of elemental zombies for that particular ritual. So if I'm in the poison ritual, there will be all poison elemental zombies attacking me along with some boss and heavy zombies as well. And once all four rituals are complete, we can grab the sentinel artifact and make our way to the pap area in the engine room. And with the poison wonder weapon variant, the player can shoot these leaky pipes, which will flood the room and bring the machine back down to that location where then we can pack a punch the artifact. And now that's complete. It's time for the best step in the entire Easter egg, the planet step or the solar system step. All around the map, nine symbols are hidden. And when the player will interact with them, a gentle voice will whisper the name of a planet that it represents. These symbols are hidden all over the ship and they are hidden damn well. We can find them under furniture or behind plants. And the way that we can tell that we've gathered them all is that the final symbol won't exhibit a flash effect, letting you know that it's time to move on. Once all nine symbols are collected, the player can then make their way to the cargo hold and drain the water. When the water is finally drained, a crate in front of the cargo hold will burst open, revealing a small model of the solar system. After interacting with it, the model will begin lighting each planet in a certain order. And it's now up to us to collect each planet's essence in the order that the model stated. Now, the reason this step is so amazing is when you get out of the cargo hold, you take a look up into the sky and you see the entire solar system hovering above your head. And it is just an absolutely beautiful moment inside of this Easter egg. And I'm not sure if I can think of anything that rivals this in terms of sheer beauty, creativity, and originality. Now, the way that we complete this is by shooting each planet individually from the sky, watch its essence fall, collect it, and repeat this process until we get to the final star, aka the sun. Once the player shoots the sun down, this will place the essence at the top of the forecastle, where interacting with it will begin a final time trial. This time trial requires us to attack these large ice blocks filled with Prima Materia, while zombies and bosses swarm all around you. But if you can be calm and precise, it's not too difficult to make your way to the back of the ship without incident. And once the player does, it's time for the final boss encounter. Over the years, Treyarch has tried out so many different final boss fights to cap out their Easter eggs. And while they always are a fun way to complete a map, they usually fall short in some way, shape, or form. And while there are great boss fights like Valentina and Legion from Cold War, or the Avogadro fight from Alpha Omega, I don't think any have been as epic or challenging as this fight against the Eye of Odin. After completing this last trial, another ritual symbol will appear on the floor, only this time when we enter it, we teleport inside the iceberg which sank the Titanic. Inside of the iceberg, we can see the Yggdrasil, which is known as the world tree that supports the universe inside of Norse mythology, a tree that connects all nine worlds. And just moments prior, we were collecting the essence for all of those nine worlds during what we call the planet step. The player then swims up to the tree, placing the now Pack-a-Punch Sentinel artifact onto it, which triggers the iceberg to float out of the water, revealing the Eye of Odin. As previously mentioned, this is hands down the best boss fight in Treyarch history. It does everything right, from the gameplay to the difficulty scaling to teaching the player the different cues to watch out for from the eye. It's masterfully done. Phase 1 starts us out on the poop deck, taking out general hordes of zombies without any massive interactions from the eye. Once complete, we teleport down to the engine room for phase 2, which becomes a little more tricky due to the confined space and some slight tricks from the eye as he will throw down some frosty tornadoes that can mess things up if you're not too careful. But fortunately, every phase provides us with a max ammo and a carpenter to repair our shields because trust me, you will be absolutely needing these as you travel from phase to phase. The screen then flashes white, letting us know that phase 3 is about to begin, which pushes us into the stateroom halls. And this is where things start to really pick up. The eye will begin shooting a frost beam down the halls of the ship, and while that's happening, it opens up a weak spot into the pupil that needs to be fired upon. The problem here is timing things correctly as zombies are spawning all around you in these tiny halls. But it can be done, and once enough damage has been given to the eye, we will then be teleported to phase 4 onto the starboard side of the ship. Now, phase 4 is a similar phase to the previous one, but it's not nearly as cramped, although more zombies do spawn in, so you have to be careful as you will get swiped from behind and go down quickly, or at the very least, you're going to lose your shield, and if that happens, you're pretty much f***. 
But honestly, all the phases up to the final encounter are child's play because this is where the player takes on the eye and all types of zombies, heavy enemies, and boss zombies. The eye is also much more aggressive as he zips around the poop deck, firing his frost beam in various directions. After he has been hit enough times, he will teleport over to the front of the ship and begin shaking and emitting a high-pitched ringing sound. The player has to constantly be dealing damage to the eye, and if they fail to do so, the eye will emit a kill shot that downs everybody in the map, failing your entire run. And the reason that this process is so intense is that enemies are attacking the player constantly, so using a homunculus or having an extra teammate to stave off some of the bad guys can really help to alleviate that pressure. But once we emit enough damage during the eye's ultimate attack, the boss fight will end and the ending cutscene will begin to play. It all just went back to how it was before. No one will ever know. That apparition. I've seen it before. I know where it is. Is it somewhere you've been? Ah, uh, no. Only in books. But I do know its location. Uh, Greece. Delphi, to be specific. Then that's where we're going next. If the bad guys are there. There's a good chance my father is too. As you just saw, the ending cutscene shows all of the zombies reverting back to civilians and escaping the sinking ship. While this is occurring, a vision displays for our crew showing an archway which is likely implying a future location we will be going to. Moments later, we enter a lifeboat where Shaw tells the other three that this vision looks like somewhere he has seen before in books, Greece, Delphi to be specific. And as we are drifting back to civilization in the night, the camera pans to Bruno who has the glowing order symbol on his third eye, implicating that he is now evil. And the reason for this implication is due to the fact that Alistair brought Bruno back from the dead with the Scepter of Ra, which is unfortunately an inherent side effect of using the Scepter in this way. One of the best parts of this storyline, and this particular main quest, was just how thorough and flushed out everything was and we were only one map deep. While we had a bit of a prologue of sorts with the first episode of the comic book series, there were already so many questions posed simply from this ending alone. Where in Delphi are we going? What is so special about Greece? Is Bruno actually evil? And is it under his control or is he being controlled by somebody else? These are all such amazing and fun questions, which is something that has been lost in zombies ever since Black Ops 4. And it's something that Chaos was attempting to do right off the bat. The main quest in Voyage tends to have mixed reception from the community, and I can partially understand why. But just like most of the maps in Black Ops 4, practice makes perfect, and when you learn the little tricks of the trade, like where all the spawn locations are for things or how to streamline certain aspects, the quests really aren't that difficult. The primary issue here is that the quest is really the only offering inside of the map other than the overarching story, which is largely entangled with that main quest. As we will uncover throughout the remaining chapters of this video, the general gameplay and offering of side quests are quite stale and prove to be mostly unuseful while providing little to no replayability outside of the main easter egg. Oh, 
Over the course of time, Zombies has surely transformed into maps with a main quest and a boss fight and pushed the gameplay survival mechanics into second place which can be seen definitively throughout Black Ops 4 more so than any other game. And as much as I personally love easter eggs and Black Ops 4 in general, it should be noted that having the baseline of a generally fun gameplay loop is important, probably the most important thing, because after you complete that easter egg, what is left to do? Voyage suffers greatly here as the map's sprawling layout, tight quarters, and middling side quests makes the flaws of Black Ops 4 really stand out. This just goes to show that Voyage really only has one thing to offer, and that's an amazing main quest and boss fight. To start things off, the Titanic is just not a good place for a zombies map. When structuring the main areas, there is only so much you can do because it's a ship. It creates such strict limitations as the devs can only create a situation where the player can just run back and forth across the ship, completing whatever arbitrary tasks we're supposed to do. I'm sure I'll get a lot of pushback for saying this, but the way Voyage's layout feels is reminiscent of Origins in the sense that there is nothing but tight corridors and the constant ping-ponging from end to end. But rather than running from Gen 3 to the church, I'm just running from the poop deck to the cargo hold. But at least Origins has the crazy place that serves as the underbelly connecting all of the map's various choke points together in a way that speeds up traversal. And while Voyage does have a teleportation system, it just kind of speeds up the direction you are already headed, rather rather than bringing you to new points or to special areas that could make Voyage feel more flushed out or at least interesting. Even training enemies is pretty limiting as there are only one or two places that you can do it, because if you do attempt to experiment anywhere other than in the front of the poop deck, you risk dealing with the BO4 zombie spawn system which spawns zombies directly in front of you as you run, which isn't inherently a bad system, but it doesn't work on this map at all due to the insanely tight hallways and staircases interconnecting areas on the ship. Voyage is also the first map that introduces us to the enemy variety that the Chaos Story has to offer. While of course we will have the general zombies that are thematically tied to the ship, we also have the brand new elemental zombies that have a ton of attacks that are supposed to break up the gameplay loop and add new challenges inside of it. The poison zombies are probably the least threatening as they just wander around and deal poison damage if they get too close. The electric zombies are similar to a flashbang inside of multiplayer, but instead they shoot out an electric pulse that if it hits the player they go blind temporarily. The water zombies can apply their powers to regular zombies and give them extra health, essentially turning them all into tanks. The fire zombies will explode whenever you get too close to him, causing a boatload of damage and often causing an unwanted down if you're not careful when engaging with him. For the most part, the elemental zombies aren't a huge problem, but again, due to Voyage's tight quarters and the spawn rate at which these elemental zombies come into the map, it can be a nightmare at times with just how much is happening at any given moment. Then we have the Stoker, who serves as the heavy enemy on the map, similar to something like a Panzer in Origins, but maybe a little less threatening. The Stoker is a great enemy that's super well designed for Voyage of Despair. He has both an up-close and ranged attack, but for the most part, due to the long and narrow hallways, he attacks from afar more often than not, leading to a pretty fair and balanced gameplay loop since he doesn't overwhelm you when dealing with zombies up close. Where things really begin to get wild is when the Blightfather spawns into the ship. Now, the Blightfather is is obviously iconic, but I would be remiss if I didn't describe him. He is a giant monster bug looking creature thing that can hit the player, shoot venom that automatically tracks the player, and throws out his tongue which can grapple people and pull them close where he'll just barf on you and dump a ton of damage into you before releasing you back into the horde. Both the Stoker and the Blightfather are executed very well by Treyarch and are fun, amazing enemies to fight as opposed to the elemental zombies that don't really add too much value to the overall gameplay model since they spawn in so frequently, providing a bit of an indifferent experience just outside of the main quest line. But what about the map's wonder weapon? Well, fortunately Voyage has a pretty fun and decent wonder weapon to help balance out some of the more tedious aspects of the gameplay loop. This is known as the Kraken. The Kraken is more or less bringing to life the idea of cannons on a pirate ship, and to be honest, it's pretty funny that the devs chose to highlight this aspect of being out to sea, because as much as it really doesn't fit with the Titanic at all, it somehow does fit in the best way possible. In order to unlock this weapon, the player needs to use a regular weapon to shoot the Stoker in all of its weak points, killing it, where the player will then pick up a key that the Stoker has dropped. Once that has happened, the player will need to locate a treasure chest that can be found in a few different spots around the ship, and then kill zombies to collect their souls inside of it. After this has been completed three times, the chest will reveal an item inside of it, and it can be a handful of different things, like a compass or a telescope, and once the player knows which item it is, they need to go to the top of the ship 
and find the item sitting on a crate by the edge of the ship. Once they do and they get close enough to it, the real Kraken, the actual monster, will raise his giant tentacle arm out of the water and drop the Kraken weapon down to be picked up. The way this weapon works is basically like a glorified shotgun blast that also has a gust or explosive radius that knocks zombies on the ground, which allows you to get out of tight spaces or run through hordes after you have been cornered. It's quite a great weapon for Voyage outside of its somewhat wacky design. And alongside the standard Kraken, there are four other variants available that correspond to the elemental zombies on the map, as when they are killed with the Kraken, they will drop pieces of themselves that you can distill into elemental ammo down at the crafting table near the engine room. And while it's always fun to have tons of different side easter eggs to build up the individual elemental weapons like in Origins with the staves or in Dorizendrak with the bows, in Voyage it just feels a lot better from a gameplay point of view to have the ammo drop on the ground, pick it up, and craft it immediately at that table. It allows for safe traversal throughout the map since it's so claustrophobic, as well as convenient for wanting to try out the other ammo types and helps during the main quest when you need to switch between ammo types for one of the easter egg steps. The four variants aren't drastically different from one another in the sense of how the weapon feels to use. For example, inside of Alpha Omega, all of the Ray Gun Mark II's feel completely distinct from one another based on their ammo type and their particular use cases. But each of the elemental types feel very similar to the base Kraken, but with slight tweaks here and there, allowing the players to really just pick whichever one is their favorite more often than not. The Poison Kraken has the most narrow barrel of the four, giving the player a little more accuracy when it comes to shooting the Stoker or even the back of the Blightfather. And this weapon can be used at a distance as it's kind of like the sniper rifle variant of the Kraken family due to its capability with long range targets. The Fire Kraken is decent at mid to long range attacks as well, but can also handle those up close encounters if you so choose. The Fire Ammo will obviously burn the zombies, which is a great touch, but it doesn't really do anything special that the other Krakens can't do either. The Electric variant is probably my least favorite of the bunch, but it's great for camping as it has a really wide spread. It's also great for knocking back zombies, which gives you time to do things like reload or retreat if you absolutely need it. But the best variant of them all has to go to the water or the ice kraken as this thing is like an icy shotgun blast and when the player shoots this weapon, a gust blows around the shot, slowing down any zombies in its path, which comes in handy more often than you would think, especially during the main quest. Overall, the kraken isn't the best wonder weapon that we've ever seen before in zombies history. But when you think about the type of wonder weapon a map like Voyage of Despair needs, this is it. A close quarters cannon that blasts everything out of your path, ensuring that you don't get trapped in the wrong place at the wrong time. And while it would have been more fun to see something even more fantastical or overpowered, I think the Kraken suits Voyage just fine, and I can't really imagine any other wonder weapon taking its place, especially when it comes to high rounds. While Black Ops 4 has some of the most boring and generic high round games, I am sorry to report that Voyage doesn't really add to the excitement, despite having a wonder weapon that's great for doing just that. Taking either the electric or the ice variant to a camping spot that you prefer will probably get you pretty far, but there is still one location that to this day remains the best for high rounders, simply because you can use spawn manipulation super easily. If the player heads down to the lower grand staircase where the pack-a-punch machine appears, we can camp in the right-hand corner near this decorative pole. Standing near this pole is important as it prevents zombies from spawning into the side of you, and then all you have to do is focus on the enemies spawning in front of you and coming down the staircase. The Electric Kraken is great for this because it will level everyone down, and I think it's pretty good for taking down the Blightfathers as well, but the Ice variant is even better in my opinion because it keeps zombies coming in slow and steady, and if anything bad is to happen, you have a few moments to break free due to the fact that things are getting iced over. Now, I have seen some people get some pretty high rounds here in this location, and I personally made it to the 70s before I got bored and started messing around in other locations, and none seem to be as good as this lower grand staircase spot to achieve your goals. Over the years, we have judged many maps for their lack of depth regarding side quests, as being able to manipulate the mode in the player's favor is one of the most fun things we can do to get the maximum enjoyment from a zombie's experience. Now, earlier in the video, I touched very briefly on how the side quests in this map are not really worth the player's time, and I would like to explore that a bit, as side easter eggs are generally a cornerstone for any zombies map. On screen, I'm going to post a list of all the different side content there is to do in the map, and you will see that there is quite a bit of it. Now, unfortunately, aside from the free perk easter egg, most of these are all useless, and I don't want to waste your time breaking each one down, but conceptually, I think it's important to run through a few and explain why they are all so underwhelming, and dare I say pointless. The Ice Shield is a great example of this, 
where you have to find fireworks and niche locations around the map, find codes in the mail and cargo room, crack open a safe, check out the code, run back to the mail room, pick up a skeleton piece based off of the matching code and tuck it in the safe and then finally melee off the code breaker and do this a total of four times. Once you complete it, the player can head back to the cargo room, interact with a car that has a skeleton driver in it, which will activate the driver to begin flying around in the sky in this old tiny vehicle. While this is pretty cool that he is flying around the map, in order to get the ice shield, the player has to shoot a firework directly at the car so that the driver crashes into an iceberg and a piece of it will fly into the sky and collide into the shield, turning it into the coveted ice shield. Now, all this does is make the shield a little stronger and adds the cryo freeze alternate ammo type to the rounds. And with the amount of time that it takes to do these steps that are completely disconnected from the main quest or anything else that you're doing, it doesn't make any logical sense to complete it. And to be honest, all the side Easter eggs are like this. They simply make the player complete these long, arbitrary challenges for essentially no worthwhile reward. To upgrade the Bowie knife, you have to melee a Blightfather a handful of times, which will reward you with a one-shot melee to zombies every now and then by making them vomit sometimes. The Trident Easter egg has you finding random objects around the map to dress up a zombie in the kitchen so that you can have one round of floating or no gravity zombies. And the worst offender of all is the engine room pack-a-punch easter egg where the player shoots parts of the engine with a kraken and spins specific handles to match the corresponding blinking lights all so that pack-a-punch will be active at all stations and you can refill your ammo for one round. Why? How are they all so useless and fleeting? Why is there so much involvement for such little reward? And even if the reward is okay, there is still no reason to do them during a main quest since they don't connect in any way, shape, or form. So why would you even waste your time? I genuinely don't get it. But like I said, the free perk easter egg is alright, but even that's a little ridiculous compared to some of the other quests we've gotten over the COD Zombies lifespan. But for this one, the player needs to find six hidden fish around the map, and they're in the same location every game, but they spawn in a random order, and it's a bit tricky to isolate their location in the beginning. Some hiding spots are so good that you genuinely can't see them without adjusting your monitor's brightness. Other spots are so ridiculous that if you're playing on a lower resolution, you may just think it's a wonky pixel. But after you find all of the fish, you take them to this box on the side of the boat where, you guessed it, the Kraken will come out to play and drop a free perk on you. And again, while this isn't the best side quest ever created, it's a good enough reward to at least give some attention to completing it while performing the main easter egg so that you have a little advantage during the Eye of Odin boss fight. But whether it's the map layout, side quests, or certain enemy design, there are so many little flaws that end the player down a path of a bad time. All of these little issues could have been ironed out to provide better rewards or lessen the spawn rates of the elemental zombies. But instead, we're pummeled by these weird gameplay decisions which puts all of the weight onto Voyage's main quest as the core focus of replayability. Unless, of course, you're into Black Ops 4 side modes. If you have been keeping up with this series, then you know I have been dumping on one of the side modes pretty heavily, and that side mode is Rush. I just don't think it translates very well across most of the maps inside of BO4, especially when it comes to the Ether maps. And while it does work a lot better inside of the Chaos storyline, Voyage of Despair actually makes this mode worth your time. Rush is a mode that requires a lot of choke points and ways to get zombies away from you, which is why Voyage of Despair works so well for this mode. The main objective here is to rack up as many points as possible, and the more you get hit, the more your multiplier will go down, which in turn lowers your score. So you always need things like Stamina Up, Victorious Tortoise, and Death Perception in combination with the Viper and Dragon Specialist and Wraith Fire Grenades. That way you can use the Tier 3 level Specialist to send zombies away from you and abuse choke points, and get zombies to run through your Wraith Fires, blazing them to death. Rush is definitely not my favorite mode by any means, but it actually shines here like I said, and I think even Treyarch knew that, as they have a few dark Dark Ops challenges related to Rush and Voyage of Despair, which can be seen as a good or a bad thing depending on your perspective. But what about the Gauntlet? Well, the Gauntlet inside of Voyage of Despair is honestly fucking ruthless. There is so much disabling of features or forcing the player to use terrible weapons or resetting features so you could lose everything you've built up to. And while these concepts aren't inherently bad, Treyarch just used all of their evil tricks at such a high frequency in this Gauntlet rather than pacing them out over 
over multiple different maps, making it quite challenging to the point where I failed it two times before finally completing it on my third attempt. Challenges like reset to your starting weapon on round 23, use only your Essex on round 27, or no pack-a-punched weapons on round 29. Treyarch, you're out of your goddamn mind! Are you, are you out of your mind?! This is also the only map inside of Black Ops 4 to have received a hard gauntlet, which was supposed to ramp up everything to even a more difficult level. And I took a look at this gauntlet's challenge list to see if I wanted to do it. And the final challenge is this. What the hell am I supposed to even do with that? The only real way I can see myself trying to push through this unsinkable hard gauntlet would be to abuse elixirs. And at that point, you're just avoiding the challenge altogether. What's really frustrating about the gauntlet mode as a whole is that it doesn't reward the player for doing anything anything. It provides a few calling cards and some stickers if you do it perfectly, but those don't do anything. Why not provide a special camo or an animated charm? Something worthwhile that says, this man is an absolute psychotic invalid for completing this ridiculous challenge that has no business being in a video game. That sounds awesome to me. Voyage of Despair is a bit of a strange zombies experience. It's very limited in its scope of gameplay as the easter egg and boss fight do a lot of the heavy lifting here. It suffers from not being able to simply go back to the root of the mode and just kill zombies, and its side quests are so useless that they might as well not even be in the map as there's no point in ever completing them. But does this mean Voyage is a bad map? I don't really think so at all. The problem again lies with how Treyarch handled things by focusing all their attention on this brand new cast of characters, and while eventually Treyarch would have to bring a new storyline in at some point, no one ever thought in one million years that it would take priority over Ether during its remaining days. The Chaos storyline is such a loaded phrase inside of the zombies community as it can mean so many things to so many different people, but it all leads back to one road, shouldering the blame of the downfall of zombies. There are those who blame the community for not giving it a chance and others who blame Treyarch for pivoting away from the Aether story. But both of these perspectives lead us back to the mode not being what it once was, while pointing fingers at everyone and everything along the way. And at the forefront of all of this is Voyage of Despair, a map meant to represent this new direction that Treyarch was taking, fantastical storytelling, alternate takes on iconic historical locations, all packaged inside the mode that is Call of Duty Zombies. And while Voyage wasn't perfect and had many flaws, it was just the beginning and did a great job of representing the Chaos storyline. But how does Voyage stack up against the other Chaos maps, and how did things play out during the rest of the DLC season? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode of this Black Ops 4 Zombies retrospective series.